The name of this program is Darrow, 100 Years Later. It is a program about a remarkable man named Clarence Darrow, who was born 100 years ago. This program comes from Chicago, because that is where Darrow lived and worked and where the world learned his name. Chicago is where he died 19 years ago. If you don't know who Clarence Darrow was, you will find out in the next few minutes. If you do know who he was, you will learn some things about him that you don't already know. Clarence Darrow had an uncanny way of detecting phonies. Clarence Darrow died in March, on March 13, 1938. But his dedication to freedom of thought will live on to inspire others to hold the torch of freedom high just as he had carried it on from the men of the past. Darrow had an affinity for contradictions. He flew to them almost automatically in his discussions with others. There was a lot of talk about Clarence Darrow in Chicago today. The occasion was the celebration of the Clarence Darrow Centenary, a party held in Darrow's honor to commemorate the 100th anniversary of his birth. He was born on April 18th, 1857, in a white frame house at Farmdale, Ohio raised by his father, Amorous, at Kinsman, Ohio. He is remembered at Kinsman as the boy who would argue against everything. As a man, he learned that it was better to argue against something, and preferably something bad. And he became the greatest defense lawyer that this country has ever seen. Who will not remember the defense counsel in the Loeb Leopold murder case, or the crippling cross-examiner of William Jennings Bryan at the Scopes anti-evolution trial in Tennessee? Or the man who defended Eugene Debs, Big Bill Haywood. The greatest of them all, Clarence Seward Darrow. Lawyers can talk for hours about some of the lesser-known courtroom miracles performed by Clarence Darrow. And at one time, more than a hundred men could say, Clarence Darrow saved me from the gallows. Any man this good in a courtroom could have been expected to be pretty good out of one, and Darrow was. He was a boisterous debater who would talk on any topic a writer of books and pamphlets, a champion of unpopular causes, a man with hundreds of enemies and thousands of friends, all of whom remember him in surprising detail. In the 60 years of his law practice from 1878 to 1938, Darrow thundered and shouted and laughed his way through an incredible life. And a lot of people are around today who remember it. And today in Chicago at the Darrow Celebration, the Adult Education Council brought together some who knew Darrow and some who didn't. In paying their respects, some of the speakers touched on basic principles, Darrow principles, in a symposium on freedom under law. And they had this to say. Mrs. Edith Sampson, former member of the U.S. delegation to the United Nations. It would be simple to say in a word for whom it was that Clarence Darrow thought there should be freedom. Everybody. Every last pitiful man and woman among us, he believed, should be free. And he didn't bother himself with any subtle, complex definition of liberty. To me, he wrote, liberty meant only power to do what one wished to do. That is why, for instance, he was so vehement in denouncing prohibition. But under law, Clarence Darrow had grave doubts about the usefulness of the law. He was magnificent as a counsel. We have not seen his equal. We are not likely to. Yet he still had a genial contempt for his calling. In court, he wrote in the autobiography that had so little of biography in it, Every important issue may be thrown to the wind on account of the most senseless law or a crochet of a judge. And to the young man who had said he was thinking of going to law school, Dow wrote bluntly, the law is a bum profession, as generally practiced. It is utterly devoid of idealism and almost poverty-stricken as to any real ideas. Thank God, and I say so reverently, that thank God he was, in his own career, the flaming contradiction of that cynical summary. 
His allegiance was to the minorities. Inevitably, in this nation of ours, it was to the Negro. In one way, it was strange that he was wedded so much to that cause. He was himself little conscious of color. It happens that he was speaking of character, of the good and the bad in man rather than of race, when he made the one pronouncement so often quoted. The truth is, no man is white and no man is black. We are all freckled. Dr. Preston Bradley of the People's Church in Chicago. I happen to belong to a profession that Clarence Darrow didn't like. He didn't like my profession any more than he liked the legal profession. He didn't have too much use for either one. But many of his sharpest and most penetrating darts of criticism and attack were leveled against my profession. And I suppose that because of his attitude in that area, Mr. Darrow gained the wholly untruthful reputation of being an atheist. Clarence Darrow never was an atheist. If we are to think of atheism in terms of denial in those areas about which he knew nothing and made little speculation. He was not an atheist. If we think of atheism as characteristic of the attitude of attacking the anthropomorphic conception of God, then Clarence Darrow was an atheist. For the integrity of his thinking and the analytical capacity of his rationalization prevented Clarence Darrow from accepting any idea of God contained in the anthropomorphic concept. God to him was never an old man sitting on a cloud with long whiskers and a spear in his hand running the universe. God to him never had any such connotation. And therefore, if we were to be exact in our analysis and accepting the philosophic distinctions between atheism and agnosticism, we, of course, would say that Clarence Darrow was an atheist. But Clarence Darrow was not an atheist, and I do not think that it would be possible for anyone who did accept atheism, if there are such, to put him in that category. That he was an agnostic, none can deny. He has been called cynic, pessimist, but on deep analysis and adequate penetration, no one could possibly accuse him of that quality of cynicism or that depth of pessimism that is usually associated with those personalities who have those qualities and characteristics. Darrow's philosophy of freedom was that in the application of freedom to every area of the personality and of society, man would have uninterrupted opportunity to develop a wholly complete integrated personality. Norman Thomas, once candidate for the presidency of the United States on the socialist ticket and an old friend. After the First World War, I twice heard him debate foreign affairs in exceedingly isolationist terms. One time it was at Princeton at a National Student Conference, the climax of which was Darrow's debate against Senator Lenroot of Wisconsin. 
I forget the exact subject, but it had to do with international cooperation. On neither side was the debate a brilliant performance. Although Mr. Darrow won a lot of applause, not only by his cracks, I can think of no more accurate term, but also by his decidedly informal appearance. It was a dressy occasion. President Hibben of Princeton, who was presiding, wore academic regalia. And Senator Lenroot, evening clothes. Darrow wore his usual suit in its usual condition. <laughs> and, and effectively displayed his suspenders to the delight of the audience. And that's about all I remember of the discussion. <laughs> a, few, a few years earlier, I had presided at a debate in Carnegie Hall between Mr. Darrow and Morris Hilkert, the brilliant socialist lawyer. The debate concerned American membership in the world court on the basis of a protocol approved by Charles Evans Hughes. We chatted in an ante room before the debate, and only when an usher came to tell us it was time to begin did Darrow say to me in a loud stage whisper, Norman, have you got a copy of the protocol of the court? <laughs> I said, no, not with me. I'm only presiding. And then I added, does that mean that you haven't read it? He said, yes. How then, I asked, would you debate it? Trust me, was the answer. I could debate any question in the negative. <laughs> and in that more or less jocose answer lies the clue to many of Darrow's activities and opinions. He was a skeptic and a no-sayer. But a no-sayer in defense of what he regarded as positive rights to liberty of thought, speech, and conduct against government or the mob. Darrow was a great jury lawyer but he would have seen through the hypocrisy of the Southern Drive to make obedience to court orders protecting, for instance, the right of Negroes to vote, dependent upon a jury trial when the juries are collected exclusively from the enemies of the Negroes. We shall bear that in mind, I hope, in the discussions in Congress, if Congress ever gets to discussing it outside of committees. Men and groups calling themselves liberal have a great capacity for effective intolerance. In many fields, they are true believers and act like that. But I add that freedom based solely on cynicism or skepticism is a dubious good. To be able to believe something intensely as good for yourself and society and still to permit freedom, that's the test. It is a test that a great many liberals meet very badly. The difficulties in achieving freedom under law are very real. It is therefore the more important that Clarence Darrow, being dead, should yet speak to us. Edgar Lee Masters, who was once a law partner of Darrow's, wrote a poem about the man in 1922. It is a little-known poem, part of which is worth repeating here. This is Darrow inadequately scrawled with his young old heart and his drawl and his infinite paradox and his sadness and kindness and his artist sense that drives him to shape his life to something harmonious, even against the schemes of God. You are listening to a special program about Clarence Darrow. So far, we have heard about Darrow from old friends and admirers. In a moment, an appraisal of the man by a Boston lawyer named Joe Welch, and then Mr. Clarence Darrow's own words, which tell the story best. But now, the defense will rest for station identification. Clarence Darrow, and this is a program about him, for we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of his birth, once said... There is always one man to state the cause for freedom, and that's all we need, one. In the 60 years of his law practice between 1878 and 1938, Darrow clawed his way through an era of superstition and occasional national hallucination. He may have been dismayed at raids on the rights of working men or outraged at laws against civil liberties, but he never was silent. And his belief in the basic good sense of the people of this country was reflected in his faith in the jury system. In Chicago tonight, delivering the centennial address at the Clarence Darrow Centenary is the distinguished Boston lawyer Joseph N. Welch, an attorney known for his knowledge of the Constitution as well as his wit, urbanity, and logic. During the last 100 years of this country's history, 
Darrow was alive during 81 of them. For more than half a century, he really had impact on his country and his profession. It is only during the last 19 years that we have been without him, without his questioning voice, his inquiring mind, his generous impulses, his flashing wit, his kindly teaching, and his a great adornment to his profession and indeed to his times. Where is he now? If we answer with his own words, he is in some nirvana in which there is no thought, no pain, no joy, no dread, only endless sleep. If, sir, you were right, and you are in a deep and endless sleep, may it be a dreamless one. And if not dreamless, may all your dreams be happy ones. And if you were entirely wrong, and you one day awaken in another world, that world must, I think, offer you books to read, a little group to listen as you teach, a handful of cases to try, and unpopular causes for you to defend. No other sort of world could provide complete happiness for your great and restless spirit. Although much has been written about Darrow, the most eloquent words he wrote himself. They are the pleas he made at the close of his trial. At the celebration in Darrow's honor tonight in Chicago, the distinguished American actor Melvin Douglas reads from the trial records. It is a stifling day in July 1924. With the vicious growl of an enraged community just outside the courtroom door in Chicago, Darrow pleads for the lives of Nathan Leopold, 19 years old, and Richard Loeb, 18. They have admitted the brutal and senseless murder of Bobby Franks, a 14-year-old neighbor boy. It is Darrow's conviction that Loeb and Leopold need psychiatric help. He is asking that they be given life sentences and not be sent to the gallows. The words, then, of Clarence Darrow. If these two boys die on the scaffold, which I can never bring myself to imagine, if they do die on the scaffold, the details of this will be spread over the world. Every newspaper in the United States will carry a full account. Every newspaper of Chicago will be filled with the gruesome details. It'll enter the home of every family. Will it make men better or make them worse? I'd like to put that to the intelligence of men, at least such intelligence as they have. I'd like to appeal to the feelings of human beings, so far as they have feelings. Would it make the human heart softer or would it make it harder? How many men would be colder and crueler for it? How many men would enjoy the details? And you cannot enjoy human suffering or be affected without being affected for better or for worse. Those who enjoyed it would be affected for the worse. What influence would it have upon the millions of men who will read it? What influence would it have upon the millions of women who will read it? More sensitive, more impressionable, more imaginative than men. Would it help them if your honor should do what the state begs you to do? What influence would it have upon the infinite number of children who will devour its details as Dickie Loeb has enjoyed reading detective stories? Would it make them better or would it make them worse? The question needs no answer. You can answer it from the human heart. What influence, let me ask, will it have for the unborn babes still sleeping in their mother's womb? And what influence will it have on the psychology of the fathers and mothers to come? Do I need to argue, Your Honor, that cruelty only breeds cruelty? That hatred only causes hatred? That if there's any way to soften the human heart, which is hard enough at its best, if there's any way to kill evil and hatred and all that goes with it, it's not through evil and hatred and cruelty. It's through charity and love and understanding. I'm not pleading so much for these boys as I am for the infinite number of others to follow. Those who cannot be as well defended as these boys have been. Those who may go down in the tempest without aid. It's of them that I'm thinking. And for them that I'm begging this court not to turn backward toward the barbarous and cruel past. I'm pleading for a time when we can learn by reason and judgment and understanding and faith that all life is worth saving. That mercy is the highest attribute of man. 
Your Honor, if these boys hang, you must do it. There can be no division of responsibility here. You can never explain that the rest overpowered you. It must be by your deliberate, cool, premeditated act without a chance to shift responsibility. It wasn't a kindness to you. We placed this responsibility on your shoulders, Your Honor, because we were mindful of the rights of our clients. If I should succeed in saving these boys' lives and do nothing for the progress of the law, I should feel sad indeed. If I can succeed, my greatest reward and my greatest hope will be that I've done something for the tens of thousands of other boys, for the countless unfortunates who must tread the same road in blind childhood that these boys have trod. That I've done something to help human understanding, to temper justice with mercy, to overcome hate with love. The verdict is history. Loeb and Leopold went to prison for life and escaped the gallows. Darrell was reputed to have received a fee of a quarter of a million. Actually, he had to haggle to get $30,000, much of which he spent in preparing his case. One of the most dramatic moments in the career of Clarence Darrow came in Los Angeles in 1912. Darrow had just seen a case involving the defense of two men accused of a dynamiting collapse. One man went to prison for life. His brother, and they were J.B. and John McNamara, his brother went to prison for ten years. Then the defense attorney, Clarence Darrow, was accused of bribing a juror. If convicted, he could have been sent to San Quentin. Then he began to talk. What am I on trial for, gentlemen? You've been listening here for three months. What's it all about? <laughs> if you don't know, then you're not as intelligent as I believe. I'm not on trial for having sought to bribe a man named Lockwood. There may be, and doubtless are, many people who think I did seek to bribe him. But I'm not on trial for that. And I'll prove it to you. I'm on trial because I've been a lover of the poor, a friend of the oppressed, because I've stood by labor for all these years and have brought down upon my head the wrath of the criminal interests of this country. Whether guilty or innocent of the crime charged in the indictment, that's the reason I'm here. And that's the reason I've been pursued by as cruel a gang as ever followed a man. <sighs> I've lived a long time on Earth. And I have friends. I've stood for the weak, the poor. I've stood for the men who toil. I have friends who've come to me here in my sore distress. I have friends throughout the length and breadth of the land. And these men are the poor and the weak and the helpless. To whose cause I've given voice. If you should convict me, there'll be people to applaud the act. But if in your judgment and your wisdom and your humanity, you believe me innocent and return a verdict of not guilty in this case, I know that from thousands and tens of thousands, yea, from millions of the weak and the poor and the helpless throughout the world will come fervent thanks to this jury for saving my liberty and my name. The jury, in this case, of Clarence Darrow arguing in his own defense against a bribery charge, the jury was out for 34 minutes. Their verdict, not guilty. 
Books have been written about Darrow, notably Irving Stone's fine biography and a not-so-fine autobiography that Darrow wrote in his later years. Darrow's defense of Loeb and Leopold made up an important and verbatim part of Meyer Levin's bestseller, Compulsion. And, of course, the Scopes trial brought the pure Darrow wit and courtroom poise to the stage in Inherit the Wind. There is something of a Darrow boom on these days, quite apart from the Chicago celebration of the 100th anniversary of his birth. Part of it might be that we now are living in the age of the organization man, in the age of the peer groups and psychological motivations. Darrow, in his wild, image-smashing, sentimental, and humanitarian way, would be out of step today. And perhaps we are not only interested in the Darrow character, but a little bit wistful as well. There is a great nostalgia in the memory of Darrow, a nostalgia for the America of yesterday, of all the torments and the trials of a century in its teens and its twenties, in its adolescence. And Clarence Darrow brought dignity to that era. Today in Chicago, at the celebration, they filled a round table with old friends of Darrow's and called it a seminar. Lowell Mason, a Washington attorney and an old friend. Clarence Darrow once told me, he said, Lowell... You are the happiest individual I have ever met. He says, you know, there's two kinds of people in this world, the happy and the (laughs) well-informed. Well, when I was a young state senator and I was going to clean everything up, uh, there was a great turmoil in the papers. There were a lot of morons loose in the town doing a lot of things they shouldn't do. And so I proposed that introduced a bill that we should have a farm to put all the morons on. And we had, I had a committee meeting, and I had Clarence Darrow come and testify before it. And he said, Lowell, he says, if you put all the morons in Illinois on the farm, he says, you're going to injure merchandising, tie up manufacturing, and completely close the legislative home. <laughs> You have been listening to a special program about Clarence Darrow, the great American lawyer. It has come from Chicago, where the Darrow Centenary is being held. I am John Chancellor of NBC News, Chicago. Listen to news every hour on the hour over most of these NBC radio stations. That was Darrow, all right. Plain of speech, sometimes painfully plain, and that commonness, if so you can label it, was his stock in trade as a lawyer. Another attorney, another Chicagoan, appraises his courtroom technique. Here is James Daniels. I I remember distinctly. It was during what we called in those days, I think, the communist trial. I think Bross Lloyd was one of the defendants. And they had assigned a special prosecutor, a man named Comerford, who subsequently became a judge. He was a white-haired boy of the Democratic Party. And, well, he was meticulous in his dress and speech to the point that some people might even call him foppish. And if there was ever a contrast between two men, especially in the same arena, it was between Comerford and this big, ungainly Clarence Darrow with his coat off and... uh, his suspenders over his shoulder and his shirt rumpled and nothing about him at all to indicate that he cared in the least how he looked. And uh, Comerford, uh, even his speech was entirely different than that of of, of uh, Darrell. Comerford was given to the polysyllable. He was a very flourishing speaker. Uh gesticulated at great length. And I remember examining the jury, and this thing stands out in my mind because I've examined many juries since then myself. Uh, they were just common run, a crosscut of, uh, of Chicago populace, and Comerford was qualifying them. Uh, he was particularly interested in whether or not they'd been uh, influenced by anything that they'd uh, seen in the papers. And he... he I don't remember his language, but in substance it amounted something like this. He asked one fellow whose name was, we'll say Joe. Uh, He said to him, he said, uh, did you ever have occasion uh, to uh, 
prior to this litigation to uh, uh, come across any periodicals or propaganda dealing with this particular issue. And uh, the juror, simple man, looked at him a little bit in amazement and finally Comerford dropped him and and uh, Darrow took over the examination. The first question they asked him it was such a vivid contrast. He said, Joe, he said, did you read anything in the paper about this thing? He said, do you ever talk to anybody about it? And uh, Joe said, yes. And he says, is it going to make it tougher for me, he says, to try this case because you read something? And Joe said, no. Well, it was an extreme in uh, an address. Darrow was, and I don't know if any of his biographers ever paid particular note to this, possibly have, but he was a almost a worshiper of the Saxon in English. He spoke an English that anybody could understand, and yet it was a good English. Uh, I might say he, he had the, es- the Esperanto of English. Uh, it was a universal language. Clarence Darrow made considerable use of that Saxon English as a lecturer, a debater. He was unexcelled. He was a free thinker, a dissenter, a liberal, and he never ran from an interesting subject. His love for talk was almost an all-consuming passion. Roger Baldwin recalls Darrow, the lecturer. I heard him in one debate, and a debate which he very frequently used, entitled, Is Life Worth Living?, Mr. Darrow took the position that life was not worth living. And, of course, every clergyman he debated took the position that it was worth living. Mr. Darrow's general line was that you couldn't uh, figure out any purpose in life, that it was all pretty futile, and that uh, we, each of us, lived only because of the satisfactions and pleasures that we managed to get out of our enthusiasms and our interests. And he had a little story he used to illustrate it with, in which he said that he had learned by his own long experience that you could only live happily if you doped yourself, as he said. Doped yourself with some enthusiasm, some interest, which uh, transcended the business of daily living. He said he'd tried all the different kinds of dope himself and they hadn't worked. He'd tried religion and socialism and women, and he says none of them really got him anywhere. But then he found one that did. Hard work. He said what the, thing, the right thing to do was to get a hold of something and work so hard at it that you forgot you were living. And then you were just as well off as if you were dead. <clears throat> well, this uh, witty and cynical line, of course, got audiences. And it also got his opponents confused. It was a hard line to beat. He enjoyed this. He enjoyed it so much that it really contradicted his own... Uh, notion that life wasn't worth living. Biography and sound will continue after a 10-second pause for station identification. We continue with Nightline's biography and sound. Clarence Darrow, attorney for the defense. Again, W.W. W. Chaplin. Darrow's quick mind, his ability to debate simply the most complicated of subjects, is remembered well by another debater of note, by another dissenter of note. Here is Norman Thomas. His brilliance was devoted to showing why a man was not guilty, why a conventionally accepted belief was not true. An episode in my own experience illustrates that point. Charles Evans Hughes, then Secretary of State, had approved a protocol by which the United States would join the world court. The issue was controversial and I found myself presiding over a debate on it in Carnegie Hall between Clarence Darrow and the very able socialist lawyer, Morris Hilton. We were chatting amiably in the anteroom when the head usher informed us that it was time to go on the stage. Only then did Darrow say to me in a stage whisper, Norman, have you got a copy of the protocol? I said, no, not with me. Does that mean you haven't read it? Yes, said he. How then, I asked, are you going to debate it? Trust me, he answered. I can debate any question in the negative. And he did. Not as brilliantly as his opponent, but his argument was of the sort that kept the Senate from ratifying the protocol. Darrow's negativism, however, often had positive results for justice. I was close to him in only one of his famous cases. 
Shortly after Mussolini came to power, he encouraged the organization of black shirts in Italian districts in New York. That fascinating character, Carlo Tresca, more than any other man, saved us from them. One Memorial Day in the Bronx, two local leaders of the black shirts were shot down in cold blood on their way to a parade. There was no immediate arrest, but eventually Greco and Carrillo, well-known anti-fascists, were arrested. Carlo Tresca formed a United Front Committee to defend them. The committee wanted Darrell as lawyer. Arthur Garfield Hayes and Vito Mark Antonio, then a rising young man in Fiorello LaGuardia's office, offered their help. I was told to approach Darrell, and if memory serves me, did it by telephone with Tresca at my back. Darrell said he would have to ask a $10,000 fee. Since we were depending largely on nickels and dimes from the poor, I hesitated. But Tresca literally shoved me in the back and ordered me to say yes. I did, and Darrow took over. The prosecution had an extremely weak case, and a lesser man than Darrow might have won. His victory was triumphant. We had managed to pay all the other bills, but had nothing in the treasury for his fee, and I saw a small chance of raising it. Heavy was my gloom despite our victory. Again, Tresca saved the day. He said, tonight we'll go to that party at Art Hayes. You wait for the right moment and tell Clarence how things stand. He's proud of his victory, and I'm sure he'll forget the fee. Once more, I obeyed with inner fear and trembling. But Tresca was a good prophet. Darrow generously forgave the debt. It was like the big-hearted lawyer, whose skepticism about mankind was great but whose concern for justice to individual men was greater. In Chicago, there still exists a law firm carrying his name, Darrow, Smith, and Carlin. A former partner, and he had many in his career, talks of the man. Here is William L. Carlin. I uh, started uh, to uh, work for Mr. Darrow as an office boy, relieving an office boy regularly employed in... uh, the summer of uh, 1902. You immediately knew that you were in the presence of a great man when you were in his presence. Something about his face, something about his manner of approach to you, he made you feel at home. He wanted to be your friend. It was the most unorthodox law office ever in this town. He he was interested only uh, to have you there if there was work to do. If there wasn't work to do, he... He were perfect liberty to leave. He had no rules. He always had time to talk to anyone that came in the office. He never shuttled them off to someone in the office. He, uh, and uh, for instance, during the Loeb and Leopold trial, when he had a great many things in his mind by reason of that trial, yet when anyone came in to see him during that trial, he had time to see him at the noon hour or he would take them over to the court, courthouse with him and discuss their problems on his way to court. He was a liberal in his thinking. He was a liberal all the way through. He was against politician. He was strictly for the, uh, for the man who was a liberal, not, well, not his party. Politics was a use against politics. He was a homely man in the sense that uh, if you're looking for a good-looking man, but he was a fine-looking man if you were looking for a man of character. His face was lined with character. He was a very sloppy dresser. He, uh, Mrs. Darrow had all she could do to get him to go to the tailor to get a suit. He refused to wear dress suits or tuxedos unless he absolutely had to. He got a shine uh, every six months. The barber used to kid him about that. The colored boy had asked for, had talked about getting a shine. He was I'm not due until Christmas. This would be in July. And he didn't care much about how his tie looked or how with his hair was. He used to comb his hair with a towel. He'd be going to make a speech, a banquet. And he'd take one look at the looking glass and he'd get the, uh, get the, his hands wet and uh, plaster it down and say, how do I look? And out he'd go without a shoe shine. I say that he was a great, simple man who fought for the rights of the poor and the oppressed. He was, uh, 
He was always for the poor. He was a crusader, I often say it, and I keep on saying it, for freedom, which I think in this day and age is a very necessary thing. The thing that impressed me a great deal was the fact that he always had time for other people and their troubles. To today's generation, Clarence Darrow is perhaps best remembered for the monkey trial in Tennessee or the Loeb Leopold murder case. Too few perhaps know of his earlier and possibly greater successes. As a young man, he defended trade unionism. In those days, a phrase akin to a dirty word. In California lives author Irving Stone, writer of the biography, Clarence Darrow, for the defense. Stone, in his exhaustive research, has captured those difficult and productive hours in the life of Darrow. There was the defense of Eugene Debs, for example, and Irving Stone tells about it now. It's pretty commonly agreed that Clarence Darrow is America's greatest labor lawyer. But what is not so well known is that <clears throat> Darrow gave up a highly remunerative job as legal counsel for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad in order to defend Eugene V. Debs, who was a total stranger to him, when Debs founded the American Railway Union and took that union out on strike against Pullman, who had created one of the most tragic and deeply suffered labor situations America had ever known. Now, Darrow was a liberal, a man who had been brought up on the great books and the great thinkers, and he was a fighter. Yet he was also a man who believed in nonviolence. But he believed at this point that the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad was attempting violence against the working people of America because the railroad had gotten out an injunction which made it not only illegal for a man to strike in America, but actually a prison offense an offense for which Eugene V. Debs was at this moment in jail. When Darrow walked out of his job to defend the labor union, he changed his entire life, and he also changed the entire life of America. It was Darrow's idea that a man who worked for a living was entitled to a good wage and was entitled to the protection of his job and was entitled to consult with his own working men, his own fellow workers, in order to better their own position in life. Darrow, when he went into this trial, lost not only his job, but all of most of his friends and all of his sympathizers in Chicago. He helped the American Railway Union uh, not win the strike, but gain certain concessions from Pullman. But at the end of that time, though he had helped labor considerably, he was out of a job, he was broke, he had no one to turn to because he was now thought of as a radical. This was the beginning of his great career, and it was the beginning of his place in defending labor. And the heartbreaking McNamara case. In the entire story of the conflict between labor and management in this country, there's no case so tragic as the bombing of the Los Angeles Times building in 1911. At this time, Los Angeles was called the worst open shop city in America controlled by the Los Angeles Times and by the Merchants and Manufacturers Association. No union was allowed to form. No company was allowed to let a union member work for it, or it had its credit cut off and its customers kept away from it. In an effort to put unions into Los Angeles, the steel workers sent in a number of organizers, and violence began at once. At this point, the McNamara brothers were sent into Los Angeles to put a bomb in part of the Los Angeles Times building to cause an explosion in the mistaken and forlorn idea that this could frighten the people of Los Angeles into letting the unions in. The tragedy arose when the bomb explosion caused a gas line to blow up the entire Los Angeles Times building and to kill 20 innocent working men. In order to have the best possible defense for the McNamara brothers, unions called in Clarence Darrow once again because he was the greatest defender labor had in America. Darrow did not want to come. He wanted to build up his practice. He was not well. And yet labor said, you must come into this trial or you will convict the McNamaras of being guilty. Darrow came to Los Angeles on the assumption that his clients were innocent. But in his investigations, he found that they were indeed guilty of setting off the bomb. And he thereupon caused a, almost an upheaval in America by insisting that the men had to plead guilty to the crime and take their punishment. The union said that he had been a traitor. 
Badaro did not approve of violence, and he said to the American people, we will plead those innocent who are innocent, but those who have committed this kind of crime, we will throw on the mercy of the courts. He did so in a speech which the entire nation listened to, telling them of the wrongs that had been committed against labor, but by the same token, token telling labor that they must not commit crimes or illegal acts, that they must work in peace and in harmony with management to achieve the ends that labor and management both want and need so desperately in this country. The McNamaras were given life sentences, the older of the two being pardoned after a great many years, the younger brother dying in prison. Darrow himself was then arrested and tried for a subornation of perjury, tried not once but twice by the same forces that wanted to keep union and organized labor out of Los Angeles. He very nearly had to go to the penitentiary for the rest of his life, but his brilliant pleas for the men he had defended, for the poor, for the weak, for the downtrodden, for those who desperately needed a voice, earned him an acquittal by both juries in the both trials. The McNamara trial showed, as did a great many of his other cases, that Darrow detested the thought of capital punishment. But even that distaste was not without a tinge of Darrow humor. Again, Roger Baldwin of the Civil Liberties Union. Darrow is a lifelong opponent of capital punishment. And I believe for some years headed a national association to abolish capital punishment. He was always against the death penalty, of course, in the cases which he defended, but he was also against it on principle. I once went with him to Washington when he testified before some committee of Congress, which had a bill abolishing capital punishment, I believe, in the federal jurisdiction. Now, I remember one remark he made, which was uh, certainly uh, a, a key to uh, his attitude and certainly impressed the congressman. He said... I never wanted to kill any man myself, and I don't think the state ought to kill any man either. But I must admit, he said, I read a good many obituary notices with great satisfaction. And Darrow possessed that same sort of humor about something else he disliked. And Professor Smith recalls that humor as applied to religion. He came up to my office one day when I was in Congress... But back at home, the city of Chicago, his old face, weather-beaten as it was, just simply beaming with joy. I said, Clarence, you must have got uh, news that some wealthy uncle died and left you a legacy. I never saw you look so happy. No, he said, not that, but thing next to that. said, I made a discovery last night that gives me more pleasure than anything I ever discovered in my life. I said, what in the world could this be? But he said, you know, I've always been against religion. I said, yes, I know you have, but all I ever observed that the consequences was that you fell in love with every priest, preacher, and rabbi you ever debated with, and you loved Christians, till I think you're more Christian than they are. Well, he said, I resent that. <clears throat> but he said, I've always been against it, and I've never been able to do anything about it. I said, you discovered last night how to get rid of religion. That's quite an order. Well, he said, I think I did, but it required your help. Now, I said, count me out of this enterprise. But what did you discover? Well, he said, don't you know in reading the biographies of the great men that it always says that they got religion at their mother's knees? Well, I said, yes, so what? We well, said, don't you see, all we got to do is to pass a law cutting off all mother's knees and stop the nonsense at its source. Well, have we summed up the man? Have we told the story of Clarence Darrow? Not quite. We have searched in the course of this biography and sound for one word that would best sum up Clarence Darrow. Perhaps because of its very simplicity, that word is friend. Like the friend he made of a Chicago cab driver. He's Clifford Richards. Our meeting started when, getting in my yellow cab, he found me working a difficult crossword puzzle. I was stuck. He finished the puzzle. This coupled with a conversation which revealed I had some out-of-print books which he wished to read resulted in our meeting rather irregularly in the park across from his home. After 1930, when he seldom went to his office, our trice increased. He talked of many things, religion, politics, events of the day, and of Governor Altgelt, who was his guide and inspiration. Listening to him, I received a liberal education. 
I would read to him from the leading weekly book reviews the reviews of books I knew he would like. Many of these he bought. Quite a few of them he would have hand over to me, and they now repose in my library. The most fitting tribute I can find is a paraphrase of the last paragraph of the address Mr. Darrow gave at Governor Altgelt's funeral. It goes something like this. Devotedly have we followed you. Implicitly have we trusted you. Fondly have we loved you. Your chair is vacant now, and we must stagger on the best we can alone. In the darkest hours, we look in vain for your loved form. We will listen hopelessly for your devoted, fearless voice. But though your ashes have been scattered to the winds, your brave words will speak for the poor, the oppressed, the captive, and the weak. And your devoted life inspire countless souls to do and dare in the holy cause for which you lived and died. Slim Brundage, proprietor of Chicago's College of Complexes, A later stronghold of free thinking has other recollections. When I first came to Chicago, I was an habitué of the Bug Club, which would attract up to 3,000 people to listen to speeches in Washington Park on a Sunday afternoon. During World War I, the city fathers decided there were too many German sympathizers and ordered it disbanded. In those days, there were those who thought free speech was worth fighting for. Being one of the bugs, Clarence Darrow signed a petition demanding an injunction against the police department from stopping the meetings of the bug club. Darrow was the first signature. 15,000 people signed it after him. The order against free, free speech was rescinded, and I became a bug in 1923. Hadn't been for Darrow, there'd have probably never been any bug club. You can get out of the books most of the things he accomplished. What kind of a man he was can only be told by the reaction other people had to him. He had never lost the common touch. His homely face would light up with a kindly smile when approached by even the humblest people. Uh, every year, Darrow was invited to be the guest of honor at the Walt Whitman dinner. One time he was called upon to talk. When he was called upon to talk, he said, You know, I've been coming to these dinners for years. Finally, I decided I'd take a night off and read Leaves of Grass. Folks... My conclusion, after a careful perusal, was that Whitman wasn't a poet. Now, here's my idea of a real poet. He held up a thin volume of The Shropshire Lad by A.E. Hausman. In his defense of Leopold and Loeb, he quoted Hausman twice. Immediately upon reading the verses in the papers, I rushed out and bought a book. Those verses, uh, let's see. Now a hollow fires burn out to black, and lights are guttering low. Wear your shoulders, lift your pack, and leave your friends and go. Oh, never fear, man, not to dread. Look not left nor right. In all the endless road you tread, there's nothing but the night. Clarence Darrow, quoting poetry in his defense of Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. Leopold, now a free man, largely because of the tongue and the tactics and the tenacity of Clarence Darrow, wrote his own eulogy of the man just one year ago. Here is Ralph Newman, a famed Lincoln scholar, who befriended Leopold during his prison term to read it. On the occasion of the celebration of Darrow's 100th birthday just a year ago, I asked Nathan to pay tribute to Darrow. This is what he had to say. Clarence Darrow was 66, what the world calls an old man when I first made his acquaintance. But he did not give the impression of age. Rather, there was about his craggy face, about his unruly iron-gray hair, about his loose-jointed, shambling figure, a certain air of timelessness. You simply did not think of his age. Instead, you knew from his deeply lined face that he had lived, richly and deeply. Mr. Darrow was many things, philosopher, humanitarian, lawyer... Defender of the rights of the underdog. So many things that it is hard to decide which aspect of his character made the deepest impression on those who knew him. To me, at least, Mr. Darrow's fundamental characteristic was his deep-seated, all-embracing kindliness. You couldn't look at the man without being struck instantly by this keynote of his character. Clarence Darrow was far from being sure that life, under the happiest circumstances, is worth living. He knew sorrow and trouble intimately and at first hand. His instantaneous reaction toward people, especially people in trouble, was the welling forth of that tremendous instinctive kindliness and sympathy. It was so genuine, so immediate, so enforced. 
and it embraced the whole world, or at least nearly the whole world. The only things Mr. Darrow hated were what he considered cruelty, narrow-mindedness, or obstinate stupidity. Against these, he fought with every weapon he could lay a hand to. And unfortunate was the individual who, in Mr. Darrow's opinion, stood for any of these qualities. His merciless scorn, his blistering sarcasm, his rapier-like thrusts of irony must have made many an opponent squirm. But Mr. Darrow hated only these character traits, never the individual who manifested them. He was a deep and original thinker. Although he was widely read and possessed of an amazing store of the world's knowledge, the most striking characteristic of his thought was its originality. In many fields, he was a generation ahead of his time. He hated superficiality. He refused to conform for conformity's sake. One result was that he often espoused unpopular causes. It may be said of him that he was one of the best hated, as well as one of the best loved men of his day. Clarence Darrow came to visit me a few months before his death. Physically, he had grown feeble. The mark of death was on his face. But age and illness had not dimmed that piercing inner light. His wisdom, his kindliness, his understanding love of his fellow man shone out from under the wrappings of his flesh. As brilliantly on this last day I saw him as it had on the first. Nathan F. Leopold, Jr. The story of Clarence Darrow... Another in NBC's award-winning series, Biographies and Sound. Your narrator was W.W. W. Chaplin.